Okay. Alright. Kita mula ya. Good morning and salam Malaysia Madani to everyone here in Zoom and who is with us via live streaming on the APM YouTube channel. This morning, APM Honorary Fellow Lecture Series titled Globalization, War and Non-Alignment, Impact on Malaysia Economic Recovery and Future will be delivered by none other than Professor Jomo K. Sundaram. Ladies and gentlemen, as we are about to begin, I have a few housekeeping notes to make. First, I would like to seek your cooperation in completing this lecture and kindly mute your microphone to avoid interruption. Question may be asked in the chat box below. To begin this lecture, we are pleased to have President Academy Professor Malaysia, Professor Dato Insinyur Dr. Muhammad Saleh Jaffa to deliver the opening remarks. Please, please Dato. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Anne. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Emeritus Professor Dr. Jomo Kwame Sundaram, uh, Honorary Fellow of Academy Professor Malaysia as our Honorable Speaker this morning. Emeritus Professor Dr. Jamal Osman, a Fellow of Academy Professor, and also Honorary Fellow Institute Masa Depan Malaysia, Masa, as one of our discussion this morning. Emeritus Professor Dato Dr. Zakaria Abdul Rashid, former Executive Director of Malaysian Institute of Economic Research, MIER, as our second discussion this morning. And Professor Dr. Rosalind Muhammad Yusuf, Chair for the Economy and Social Wellbeing, Academy Professor Malaysia, and also Dean of Islamic Business School, the University of Otara Malaysia, as our moderator this morning. Uh, Academy Council members and Academy members, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Ramadan Karim, Salam Malaysia Madani. Um, Alhamdulillah, with us this morning, uh, we also have a group of university students, uh, about 150 of them joining from University of Malaysia Terengganu. We would like to really thank everyone uh, for attending this APM Fellow Lecture Series. Uh, this is actually a series, uh, one of, this is actually one of the flagship series that we have uh, organized by Academy Professor Malaysia. There are other flagship programs, including Academy uh, Roundtable Discussion, Academy Conference, and also Academy Webinar or Forum called Wachana Academy Professor Malaysia. This fellow lecture series is organized is, as a sign of respect for and to honor APM fellows who have excelled at national and also international levels. And they have left a strong impact with their substantial contributions in their respective fields of knowledge and also contribution to the society throughout their career. Uh, this uh, forum also serves as a platform for academic professors, scholars to discuss strategic issues that will benefit not only policymakers, but also the community as a whole. For our information, Academy currently has nine honorary fellow and they are Emeritus Professor Jomo, of course, uh, as our first honorary fellow uh, with APM, and Professor Datuk Dr. Osman Baka, Tan Sri Datuk Dr. Gauss Jasman, Tan Sri Datuk Dr. Kamal Saleh, Emeritus Professor Dr. Hans Daita Evers, Professor Datuk Dr. Morsidi Sirat, Emeritus Professor Tan Sri Dr. Anwar Ali, Emerita Professor Datuk Dr. Asma Ismail, and the most recent one is Emeritus Professor Tan Sri Datuk Dr. Sri Sharifah Habsah. Said Hassan Shahabuddin. So today, uh, APM is extremely honored and privileged to have uh, again Professor Emerita uh, Dr. Jomo to deliver our, our lectures today. Uh, I, I suppose this is his second uh, uh, series of lectures, eh, Prof. Jomo. Uh, thank you very much for making yourself available despite your very, very busy schedule. And I'm sure that you receive a lot of invitation uh, to give a speak, uh, to, to speak in many, many different platforms. And today, uh, the, 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 you know, we'll be listening to a very crit critical topic, globalizations, war, and non-alignment, impacts on Malaysia's economy, economic recovery, and future. As a renowned economist, Professor Jomo is highly qualified to speak on this topic. Economic well-being is the most crucial factor, I suppose, in achieving a society's well-being. Even in uh, recently, you know, there was a survey uh, in Occupied Palestine uh, the survey reveals that the Palestinians consider the economy as their number one issue that they are facing with. And uh, surprisingly, not even their, their daily safety and not 
not the occupation itself. Maybe they have had too long of an occupation and they believe on a day-to-day -day, you know, economic well-being of their, of their states. Yeah? And I'm sure this topic is uh, equally relevant and applicable to us in Malaysia. Uh, before we hear the talk, uh, allow me to read uh, a brief, a very, very brief indeed, by the data of Projomo. Uh, he has a long one, and I'm sure you can Google them. Professor Google will easily uh, describe him a little bit better than what we have this morning. Uh, Professor Jomo now is a senior advisor at Hazana Research Institute and uh, has held a Tun Hussein On chair in the Institute of Strategic and International Studies 2016-2017. Um, he was uh, an Assistant Secretary General uh, in the United Nations from 2005-2015. There was a 10 years uh, you know, contribution to the United Nations and uh, also an ordinary uh, honorary research coordinator for the G24 Intergovernmental Group on International Monetary Affairs and Development from 2006 to 2012. Uh, in 2007, he was awarded the Wasili Leontief Prize for Advancing the Frontiers of Economic Talks. Uh, this is among many other awards that he has received. Yeah? And he has authored and uh, edited over 100 books and translated so many of them. And besides writing, besides of course writing many academic papers and articles for the media, uh, Professor Jomo, um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, he's an honorary fellow of APM, and we are always very proud to be associated with him. I'm sure we will all benefit from Professor Jomo's lecture this morning, and I can see from the list of attendants, uh, we have a diverse uh, participants, and we do hope uh, the lectures uh, will benefit, uh, will enhance our knowledge, and in addition to the commentaries from our two discussions this morning, that is Professor Jamal and Professor Zakaria. So with that, uh, I pass back the microphone, uh, as you can see, uh, to our MC. And? Okay. And without any further ado, I would like to invite our moderator this morning, Professor Dr. Rosli Mamak Yusuf, to moderate this lecture series. Please, Prof, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ms. Anne. Yang berbahagia, our honourable speaker for today, Emeritus Professor Dr. Jo Moke Sundaram, the Honorary Fellow of Academy Professor Malaysia and Research Advisor KRI, Hazana Research Institute. Yang berbahagia, Professor Dr. I.R. Dr. Salih Jaafar, President of Academy Professor Malaysia, APM. Our distinguished discussants for today, Emeritus Professor Dr. Jamal Osman, Fellow of APM and Honorary Fellow of Institute Masa Depan Malaysia, MASA, and Master's Professor Dr. Zakari Abdul Rashid, former Executive Director of MIER, distinguished guests, fellow professors, academics, ladies and gentlemen, Salam alaikum to Allah and a very good morning. My name is Prof. Roslin, and indeed it is an honor to be the moderator for this session in the presence of the best minds of Malaysia comprised of distinguished guests, renowned scholars, fellow professors, academics, and students. Before I start, let me just share the format of today's event. We have three sessions. One, the first session will be the lecture by Professor Jomo, uh, 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 Master Professor Dr. Jomo. Second will be presentations by both discussants. And the third session will be Q&A, an interactive session between the participants, Yang Berbahagia Emeritus Prof. Dr. Jomo, and distinguished discussants. Distinguished guests, fellow professors, academics, ladies and gentlemen, as we move towards the full recovery phase with renewed optimism and hopes, Malaysia definitely has gathered momentum towards a more sustainable future growth. For instance, based on the Department of Statistics report for quarter 4, 2022, the economic performance for the fourth quarter of 2022 has surpassed the pre-pandemic level by 7.2%. Overall, Malaysia's economic performance boosted to 8.7% in 2022 as compared to just 3.1% in the previous year. And also it is the highest annual growth recorded within the period of 22 years. So I, was, I read the report in 2000, the annual growth rate was indeed 8.9%. It is also reported that in the third quarter of 2022, consumption had risen by 15% year on year the labor market also showing signs of improvement and unemployment figures moderated to about 3.6%, according to BNM report 2022. In terms of trade, Malaysian exports increased to almost 19% in the third quarter. While these vital signs seem promising, Malaysia being an open economy is far from being detached from the external international forces 
such as the global inflation, escalating Ukraine-Russia war, financial contagion of banking crisis following the collapse recently of two US regional banks and turmoil at a Swiss banking giant and others. Accordingly, the supply chain disruptions re resulted from the Ukraine-Russia war, as we all know, have impacted businesses around the world, including Malaysia, and at the same time, uh, affecting the cost of living of the rakyat. Federal Reserve is undertaking hawkish approach monetary tightening, and as response to Malaysia Central Bank, uh, Malaysia Bank, uh, Bank Negara Malaysia applied a series of rate hikes to keep capital outflows under control. This, as argued by many, may not be the best policy stance. We're going to listen more on this uh, uh, afterwards uh, from Rob Jumo. Uh, uh, fellow academics, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, for Malaysia as we progress towards a full recovery and future growth. And against the backdrop of the aforementioned issues, we see that the optic may be good. What other perspectives are we not seeing in this regard? The question that we have before us at this juncture, Prof. Jomo, are we out of the woods yet? At least for the year 2023 to 2024. What about the impact of globalization, trade liberalization on Malaysia's economic recovery? To what extent is the Ukraine-Russia war is affecting our future growth? What about our non-alignment stance and policies? Are these still relevant? Ladies and gentlemen, hang on to your seats. The questions are going to be deciphered and unraveled by our none other honorable speaker today in today's lecture, globalization, war, and non-alignment impacts on Malaysia's economic recovery and future. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, may I now invite and berbahagia Emeritus Prof. Dr. Jo Moke Sundram to deliver his lecture. Prof. Jepersilakan. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Rosalind, for those very kind words of introduction. Thank you also to the Academy for kindly inviting me to, to speak today. I particularly want to emphasize uh, my appreciation to the Academy and wish you all well. But one of the characteristics which I hope will become a feature of, uh, of Masyarakat Madani is that we will continue to import from Western Africa. As you know, Malaysian society has been enriched by uh, the introduction of oil palm and, and subsequently by cocoa uh, for a brief period, particularly during the 1980s. But today, I think a very important import would be uh, the introduction of the West African practice of dispensing with protocol and wishing you well, and then saying, um, and then saying, uh, how should I put it? Uh, uh, all protocols observed. So let me uh, um, also uh, uh, wish you all, uh, salam alaikum, uh, peace be on all. Um, I don't take this uh, greeting lightly. This greeting is a very, very uh, important greeting, especially for our times. And of course, we know that in Islam, this is taken very, very seriously, um, because uh, as you know, uh, we, we often refer to, to um, questions such as, as uh, the whole question of, of, uh, of peace. Uh, there are countries and there are cities which are called, uh, for example, the capital of Tanzania is called Darussalam. Uh, it's not by accident that it's called uh, Darussalam. And uh, likewise, we find that Brunei uh, refers to itself as Brunei Darussalam. So I think we should take this, the, this commitment to peace as something to be very, to be taken very seriously uh, by Muslims, but I hope by all others as well. Uh, this year also marks the half century, half centenary of uh, something which was agreed to by uh, various leaders in Southeast Asia, uh, namely Zokfan, uh, creating a zone of peace, freedom, and neutrality uh, in this region. Uh, this was agreed to six years after the establishment of ASEAN in 1967. Um, and uh, I think Zokfan was a very major step forward and I think extremely relevant to our times. And it's important for us to consider the circumstances in which we live and to begin to think about how to move forward. Now, if we look at the world today, the world in which we live, uh, it is often said that we have had a, a period of globalization, 
I would like to put to you that it has been very, very uneven. And now we have probably seen the end of what is often referred to as trade globalization. Secondly, I think we are seeing the normalization of war. War has become uh, a, 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 an option of first resort. And it's not necessarily war waged by military means, um, as many of you may be aware, but I think it's very important for us to recognize that war can be waged by non-military means. And uh, often this, this kind of pain and violence inflicted can be quite excruciating. For example, if you lay a state of siege, and modern economic sanctions are essentially a modern form of ancient uh, sanctions, as ancient uh, forms of siege. So I think it's very important for us to recognize that there are many countries which have suffered very greatly precisely because of sanctions imposed. The third element, of course, is I want to make a case for a non-alignment, not a non-alignment of, of the type which was which was uh, announced by leaders of the world, of the developing world in 1969, uh, sorry, sorry, 1961, um, but rather one which is relevant to our times. So this is the purpose of my lecture today, and I hope to persuade you that this is extremely important. And of course, I will do so by referring to various elements in the Malaysian economy, and particularly to some, uh, suggest to you that it is very important for us to think very seriously about uh, how the Malaysian economy might well benefit uh, uh, from a serious consideration of what seem to be non-economic elements. I, I think it's important for us to recognize that the creation of the World Trade Organization uh, in 1995 involved a so-called single commitment. This was very different from the previous system which existed under the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, better known as GATT, where there were a lot of flex flexibilities. The different conditions of different countries were taken into consideration, and it was not a one-size-fits-all arrangement as you had with, uh, with, uh, with the establishment of the WTO in 1995. Just imagine... If you had, for example, this principle of, of differential, differential rules uh, is something which is widely accepted in many areas of society. In, for example, you have in football, uh, Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three, and so on and so forth. You have a different league for women and so on. Um, now, this, similarly, you find, um, I don't play golf, but I'm sure some of you do. And those of you who play golf know very well that there is the whole idea of a handicap, which is, uh, which is very common uh, for golfers as they are beginning to learn how to play. So we find that in various types, in various elements, uh, various aspects of society, the idea of not treating everybody equally is something which is widely accepted. And this was very much accepted with the general agreement on trades and trade and tar on tariffs and trade. Sorry, uh, get, uh, but has be basically been abolished with the World Trade Organization from 1995. Another important element to recognize is that even the advocates for trade liberalization, such as uh, Jagdish Bhagwati, um, university professor at Columbia, basically recognized that so-called plurilateral free trade areas are basically termites in the system, undermining trade liberalization. Okay, So I think it's important for us to recognize that while we all think of free trade areas as wonderful arrangements and so on, progressing towards a world without uh, uh, trade barriers, in fact, they are the converse as suggested by a great advocate of trade liberalization. I don't necessarily agree with Professor Bhagwati, but it's important to recognize this view of his. Now, I think more recently, I, many of our, many people in Malaysia are not aware that the latest offer, particularly from the West, particularly from the United States, is something called the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. This accords with the latest strategic interests of the US in this part of the world, but it's not something which is a naturally uh, something which, which has been much talked about within the region, and it's important for us to, to recognize it. But also very importantly, with IPEF, it is important to recognize that the thing which was offered in the Trans-Pacific Partnership is no longer offered anymore. There is no more market access, no more access to the US market being offered. So what is it? Is it 
in IPEF, which is supposed to be attractive to people, for example, in, uh, in Southeast Asia. After all, IPEF was announced at a meeting uh, between President Biden and the leaders of uh, ASEAN. Yet another issue to remember is that the trade growth since the global financial crisis has actually been very modest, as I shall show later, but including for Malaysia, which is a very, very open economy and has become since the colonial period, but, as, but especially in the post-colonial period, even more open uh, in many respects. This is what may have been an advantage at some previous point in time, but now it becomes a problem and we need to recognize this. We also need to recognize that the WTO, unlike its uh, unlike earlier arrangements, including GATT, uh, allows any country, but in this case, for all intents and purposes, it is one country, namely the United States of America, to exercise a veto. And this it has used, for example, by preventing dispute settlement. The main attraction of WTO, of course, was the possibility of dispute settlement rather than going to court, rather than going to arbitration, you settle the disputes we have between countries, trade disputes uh, within the WTO framework. But the US, since President Obama, has held up the appointment of judges simply because they were not very happy with a judgment made by the, a Korean judge in an earlier case about a decade ago. So we can see how the, the very institutions of globalization are being undermined by the ostensible champions of globalization. Now, yet another important uh, element to remember is that in 19, uh, in, 19, uh, 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 in the mid-1990s, South African President uh, Nelson Mandela began to advocate for what was called a public, uh, a public health exception to the, um, to the WTO's TRIPS agreement. TRIPS refers to trade-related intellectual property rights, I noticed that uh, Tansri Shafi'i Abdullah is in the audience. He uh, went to study intellectual property rights uh, in uh, England, if I remember correctly, sometime in the early 1980s. He was one of the first to be trained in this area. Trade-related intellectual property rights is a, is, a, is, is a very dangerous minefield now, uh, and it has become a major source of wealth for many countries. But it's important for us to remember that, uh, that that TRIPS stands in the way of access of particularly poor people and poor countries. Now, one example, for example, uh, one issue, for example, to consider in Malaysia's case is the uh, is hepatitis C. If if we used the uh, the the American patented product for treatment of hepatitis C. It would cost sixty-eight thousand U.S. dollars. Okay, sixty-eight thousand U.S. dollars for a twelve-week treatment. Sixty-eight thousand U.S. dollars translates roughly, roughly, into about three hundred thousand ringgit. Okay, Malaysia has a, a population of thirty-four million or so, but if you include the foreign workers, it's over forty million. Okay, so we, when you when you when you That's consider the number of people in Malaysia, you have to remember that that uh, that that among the in, among the population, uh, one important element uh, to, to to consider is the number of people who are infected with hepatitis C, and uh, the only available treatment right now is cost forty eight thousand uh, sixty eight thousand uh, US dollars if you buy the American uh, patented product. However, there's an Egyptian equivalent, and thankfully, Malaysia bought, is buying the Egyptian uh, 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 generic equivalent. Uh, and uh, that also is over a 12-week period. Um, the treatment is over a 12-week period. And the cost of the Egyptian equivalent to the Malaysian government is about 1,300 ringgit. Okay? Contra consider the contrast. Some of you might remember the name of a man named Martin Shkreli, who was very involved in the case uh, where he took a case. Uh, uh, sorry, he was he was charged and uh, he he fought this case, uh, basically uh, take um, you know asserting the right to charge anything he wanted uh, for, for, and he he basically took a drug which was basic selling for twelve thousand. Uh, sorry, twelve ringgit fifty. For 12 US dollars and 50 cents, 
and he increased the price of that drug to 750. Uh, basically, a 6,000% increase in the price of the drug. 6,000% increase in the price of the drug. Okay, and Shkreli, but under US law, uh, Loretta Lynch, the attorney general who's well known for, for prosecuting, uh, for pursuing the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, uh, one MDB case, among others, Loretta Lynch uh, basically could not prosecute him for for doing for 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 price gouging, for example. Instead, she prosecuted him for running a Ponzi scheme, and he was he was successfully prosecuted, and he went to jail. So, I think it's very important to recognize that many legal environments actually enable price gouging by monopolists. And we saw this happening recently when yeah, during the pandemic, coming. when the Western countries basically refused Monopolies. to allow any concessions as far as the price of uh, of medicines, as well as treatments, as well as tests, as well as equipment uh, in connection with COVID-19. So the implications of this are very, very dire. It has nothing to do with trade. In fact, the very principle of intellectual property rights is to confer a monopoly, a legal monopoly on the country, on the company concerned, the, the company which owns the intellectual property right. Jonas Salk, who invented the polio vaccine, when he first when it was put to him, why hasn't he patented the vaccine? He said, This is like patenting the sun. You cannot patent the sun. This belongs to everybody. You know, it's ridiculous to even think about patenting the sun. But unfortunately, we live in very different times. Now, the last point I think I want to make in this connection is that trade liberalization and trade globalization is very different from other types of globalization. And we need to think about that uh, in connection with the, our, our subject today. Let me go a little bit faster because I, I, I'm taking a little bit too much time. And I think it's important for us to recognize that recently, it has become normal to impose sanctions. Sanctions have been imposed, as, as many people know, for over six decades on countries such as Cuba and, and so on, for over three decades of, of almost more than four decades, sorry, in the case of uh, Iran uh, and, and, and so on. But, but so sanctions are basically a tool of economic warfare. I want to emphasize that all NATO sanctions and all Western sanctions currently being imposed have got uh, do not have do not pass the criteria do not do not are not approved by the UN Charter. They are, in other words, illegal under international law. But nonetheless, they continue. Okay, it's very important for us to recognize this. Nobody has taken up a case because the the legal, whole entire legal system is so uh, it's on the it, it's so biased in in many ways and is hugely problematic. But it's important for us to recognize that in this, what is now called the Second Cold War, there is trade. Uh, it has been extended to areas beyond trade, including investments, including technology and finance. And this has become very evident during the last year when we think about the sanctions imposed against the Russian Federation. I'm not approving for one moment of what the Russians did with regards to Ukraine, but it's important for us to recognize that these are all illegal sanctions. And it's important also to recognize that the trend towards greater market access is no longer the case. And if we look at what has happened since the global financial crisis uh, over a dozen years ago, uh, in fact, there has been a narrowing of market access rather than a, an extension of market access. So it is naive to think that we are going to get a better deal through things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership or the compre com so-called comprehensive and progressive uh, uh, the partnership, uh, sorry, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and various other uh, uh, poor imitations or ersatz imitations thereof. It's important to recognize that we now have e investment sanctions. When President Trump was, prime, was President of the United States, he made this very clear. First, he called for reshoring of relocating uh, American uh, industries in the United States. Uh, this didn't work. Uh, and then now he calls for, and then subsequently he called for friend shoring. In other words, getting out of in of China and relocating in in so-called friendly countries. But as I'm going to show later, this is a hugely problematic for a country like Malaysia, 
Malaysia is very, very heavily involved in many of the so-called international supply chains, which were once promoted in the era of globalization, and now will be greatly penalized uh, by this kind of so-called French shoring. We also have seen how technology war has been developed, has been extended to various areas. I, I, I've already mentioned a few of them, but the Huawei case, the, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation and, and Samsung uh, cases. And of course, we have seen in financial transactions how the Russians, for example, have been denied access to the Swiss, SWIFT arrangements. Sometimes you begin to think that people do things out of uh, without thinking through the implications. So what we have seen now is the increasing promotion and growth of alternative payment, international payment systems. And some of this will eventually undermine the United States, uh, which has been, which has basically got control of the SWIFT payment system. So we, we begin to wonder whether you know, the, these people actually think through what they're doing. But you know, short-termism prevails because of the political cycles. And as a result, we, many of these things are not necessarily the most well-considered policies. Now, so basically what we have had in recent times with COVID-19 pandemic, with war, and more importantly, with the sanctions which have been imposed to the war, are various types of disruptions, which are on the, what economists call the supply side, not on the demand side. And basically, these have resulted in higher costs, but these are largely one-shot increases. And this is very important for us to consider and when we think about what is happening in the world today. Because what is happening in the world today and what we have seen in the last, uh, uh, last decade and a half or so is uh, in response to the global financial crisis um, the, and, and the so-called Great Recession, we saw the introduction of unconventional international monetary instruments uh, particularly something called quantitative easing or QE. And QE has basically resulted in greater financialization of the economy. Okay, So uh, on the one hand, you have a reduction of trade globalization, but increasing financial globalization. And this greater financial globalization, of course, has been a very uneven process because financial systems are regulated very differently in different parts of the world. But particularly in the, in the United States, for example, it, uh, it basically meant a free money or very low cost money. Uh, and this basically enabled those with money uh, to, to, uh, to strengthen their control. That is why during this period of the pandemic, when you expect all people to, to suffer, uh, including, including the super rich, uh, it was during this period that you find that the billionaires actually increased their wealth and the number of people who became billionaires actually continued to increase. How, how does this happen? It, that's a very important question to, to ask ourselves. And it's very important to recognize how QE uh, basic, basically enabled this. Now, in the last year, as we all know, uh, the US uh, Federal Reserve Bank has increased interest rates. And the result of, in, of this interest rate uh, hikes, and they have been continuous, has been uh, a contraction of the world economy. Um, this contraction is slow and steady, but nonetheless, it is a contraction and it's going to basically re, uh, uh, affect people in, in various different ways. Now, to be sure, there are also market and other financial pressures for for uh, for for economic for fiscal austerity, meaning the government should spend less. Okay, so the kind of increase in government spending during the during the the last uh, two regimes under Prime Minister Mayuddin and Prime Minister and, and Prime Minister Ismail Sabri uh, basically uh, are, are coming to an end, partly because a lot of this was done on 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 money from. Uh, on borrowed money, on increased borrowings, you know, and you and we have seen, of course, uh, a huge increase in borrowings uh, over well over for well over a decade, and these borrowings have gone to various various dubious purposes, um, and uh, in, including, for example, in the name of infrastructure, we have seen a great deal which has been which has been uh, which is being built or has been built uh, of dubious benefits. Uh, and certainly non-commercial. So you have a lot of borrowings which have been done uh, with well over a trillion. 
uh, uh, has been borrowed by the Malaysian government. And then another half trillion or so, uh, which has been borrowed off the books uh, through what is called government guaranteed foreign borrowings. So if you think about 1MDB, it, it does not enter the, the, the government books directly, but it's government guaranteed. Similarly with e ECRL, similarly with Dana Infrastructure, and so on and so forth. So you have a, 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 a huge problem here because these governments have been borrowing, borrowing, borrowing without thinking through the implications. And, and of course, interest rates were relatively low in the last decade or so, but now interest rates are going up again and this imposes new constraints on government. So this new government, which has come in in the, in the last few months, uh, is going to be financially constrained uh, by these new circumstances. So I used to warn uh, 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 over a year ago and even in the first half, uh, in, in, in the middle of last year, about the possibility of stagflation. In other words, a combination of economic stagnation together with inflation. But now I no longer believe this to be the case. And I have to explain to you why I no longer believe this to be the case, because the possibility for accelerating inflation is largely gone. For those of you who have studied some economics, you all will remember that a one-shot increase in prices is something which we don't want, we don't like, but is not something which is hugely problematic. What is problematic is what is called accelerating inflation. And in economics, there is a concept of NIRU, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. So if as long as inflation is not accelerating, it's not a problem. And this is basically something which we do. And so what we have seen is that there was a big increase in inflation during the, the, the uh, last four months of the first half of last year. That means from the time of the Ukrainian invasion and the sanctions were, were beginning to be imposed. So basically in March, uh, uh, April, uh, May, and June. But since the middle of last year, uh, inflation has not continued to accelerate in the US inflation has basically tapered down. Uh, but nonetheless, the US uh, Federal Reserve is continuing to pursue, in, uh, pursue uh, interest rate hikes. And this will slow down not only the US economy, but it will slow down the world economy. And let's face it, there are very few countries in the world with close to full employment. The US is one of them, Singapore may be another one, and Malaysia is arguably close to full employment. But for the rest of the world, we do not have that kind of situation. So we are likely to see continued stagnation. But the effect, why is the US doing this? Well, if you read between the lines of the Wall Street Journal, which is the concept, the, 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 the newspaper of the, of, the, of the American right wing, thanks to Mr. Rupert Murdoch, what you basically see uh, uh, is that it is basically class warfare. It is an attempt to reduce uh, working conditions, particularly for the American working class, because of the perception that American work workers have become more uppity. Not because their unions are strong. Their unions have been smashed. The unions have basically retreated a long time ago. But what we have seen in the United States, in, the, in uh, as some, some of you may know, is something called the Great Re Resignation. And this Great Resignation basically meant that workers could choose the jobs they wanted to do. They didn't have to do, just accept any old jobs. And this was made possible thanks to policies by Barack Obama to ensure full employment, which were continued by his uh, nemesis, uh, Donald Trump, and which have been continued by Joe Biden. So basically the Fed policy is considered to be a form of class warfare by certain quarters. I don't necessarily fully endorse this view, but I think it is something to consider. But as far as the rest of the world is concerned, where you do not have full employment, the implications are much, much more dire. Now, also one of the things or consequences of the sanctions, as you know, is that by encouraging America, uh, 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 Europeans particularly to get away from Russian oil and gas, uh, what you see is a, and, and uh, the going back to, to coal and so on, what you see is uh, an acceleration of global heating. And this is, is worse in the tropics. I don't have time to, uh, to discuss this, but many of, many of you are aware about how uh, the, trop the tropics have been heating up and the dire consequences in the tropics. 
uh, Professor Maslan Os Osman, for example, has, has often uh, uh, highlighted this in her um, in, in through, through the, the, the Mahde Prize Initiative, uh, through the Academy of Science Malaysia and so on. So what, what we have now is a situation where uh, com um, uh, commodity prices and exports went up uh, briefly, but in inflation is no longer accelerating. And this, I think, is a very important uh, situation thing to consider. I will largely skip over this price, uh, this slide, except to emphasize that uh, that fuel, food, and fertilizer prices have been have been increased, not because they have been naturally increased by market force. Uh, you know, nothing about the market is natural, of course, but you know they've been due to 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 market forces alone. In fact, they have increased mainly due to the sanctions imposed on Russia and its allies, uh, Belarus, and so on, as well. And this has adversely affected uh, 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 Ukraine as well uh, because of access uh, to the Black Sea uh, in terms of ex exporting uh, whatever the Ukraine, Ukraine exports uh, through the Black Sea. Uh, and so this is very important for us to recognize uh, that the situation is, again, due to war. It is not due to, uh, to, to the market forces in and of themselves. Um, I've already emphasized, and again, I will skip over this because I'm running out of time, uh, how interest rates in, uh, are, are basically um, uh, slowing down the world economy. But I want to make a couple of points uh, as far as this slide is concerned. It's very important to recognize that rate hikes are very blunt tools. They are not very sharp tools. They're not very targeted tools. They are very blunt tools, number one. Number two, rate hikes affect, affect the demand side. But as I've tried to, uh, to point out, what we see is, is, a, is a stagnation of the world economy, which has been due to, to supply side disruptions. So how do you, how do you uh, uh, improve the supply side if you, if you are taking demand side actions? It's, it, it boggles the imagination, but yet you find a series of people in the market repeating mantras about how you need to in increase uh, the interest rates as if that is the way to, to go. And when the Bank Negara Malaysia, for example, uh, refused to ra uh, raise interest rates uh, recently, it, it was subjected to a great deal of, of criticism by all and sundry uh, because of its refusal to do so. I think it's important for us to recognize that this was actually uh, a, a, a very good action. It's also important to recognize that this so-called 2% uh, target, which is again a mantra of central bankers all over the world, is something which actually was created in a very arbitrary way. In 1989, the, uh, the, the, the uh, what do you call it, uh, the, the government of, of uh, um, New Zealand, the, the finance minister of New Zealand 19, in 1989, asked the governor of the Central Bank of New Zealand, the, called the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, uh, you know, to, to try to bring down uh, inflation. And he came up with the slogan, you know, th that was 1989. He said, I, I think by the 1992 elections, it'd be good to bring it down to 2%. So two by 92 became his slogan. And that's how all in, um, central bankers swear by 2% two by, two uh, inflation target. It's completely arbitrary, but this is the kind of ridiculous uh, thinking which goes on as far as uh, as far as public policy is concerned. And this, of course, has huge implications and is uh, and is greatly uh, adversely affecting uh, the world economy in 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 many different ways. Now, let me um, uh, quickly go on to emphasize that the the G seven, uh, the most powerful economies in the world. Uh, together with NATO, are uh, basically uh, ret retarding growth in various different ways. I don't want to re uh, to summarize again all the details which I, I I emphasized earlier, but I think as a consequence of this, uh, we find that that uh, geopolitics, what is called geopolitics, has become extremely important, and and uh, this has result. This is worsening the world situation. But I want to emphasize one other matter in this re in, in this connection. And that is that not only in the areas which I'm discussing, but in a whole range of other areas, we find that the rich countries are making international arrangements which are at the debt, which are debt, 
adversely affecting poor countries. For example, the OECD, which is the, the club of rich countries, has created a so-called inclusive framework to have a tax deal. The whole idea is to avoid an international tax arrangement under the auspices of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, or the United Nations, which are the more legitimate, inclusive multilateral organizations for doing so. Instead, it is imposing some uh, arrangements. I don't have time to get into all the details now, but imposing arrangements for international, for corporate income taxation, which are basically to the detriment of developing countries, mainly by distributing the taxes on the basis of consumption. In other words, who make who who buys the products rather than on, uh, which is basically those people who can afford it, the the rich, rather than on the basis of who makes the products. For example, if they are made in 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 uh, in the free trade zones in Penang or elsewhere. So this is a very fundamental shift in the in the in the not only uh, in in the uh, distribution of re of revenue. And unfortunately, developing countries have just happily gone along with all these uh, uh, arrangements without critically resisting it and, and insisting that a truly multilateral in inclusive organization such as the UN or the IMF should be the correct uh, uh, forum for, for doing this instead of what, what is currently happening. So, the, you know, so if we, if we time and time and time again, we are we are conceding, and this is precisely why it is so important that we pay attention to what is happening in the world. Uh, we pay attention to what is necessary, uh, and and uh, and and basically look to ourselves for alternatives instead of always looking west and looking north, as has been the case for 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 decades. Now, yet another issue, of course, is uh, the whole question of the state of stagnation, which which we are which we are finding ourselves increasingly in, and the likelihood of depression, because you cannot fine tune these things. You know, uh, it wasn't as if the Great Depression in the 1930s uh, was a, was something which was uh, intended, uh, but not, not, and and uh, when the attempts to recover from that Great Depression. Uh, were were abandoned in 1937. Uh, the result was uh, the continuation of the Great Depression, and arguably it was World War II, uh, which resulted in the full uh, in in full employment. Even uh, many women were joined the workforce for the first time uh, in America and and elsewhere. Uh, and so you know it's important for us to recognize uh, that 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 uh, depressions do not necessarily find uh, solve themselves. And if you think about the, the different views which were expressed about the Asian financial crisis of 97, 98, the different views which were expressed about the global financial crisis and, uh, of, of 2008 uh, and so on, we begin to realize that the economics profession is, in very, is, is, is quite, uh, has a very poor track record, you know. And and uh, uh, my, my Warholian uh, minute, uh, moments of, of, of fame uh, were precisely because you know people uh, like us uh, were, were thinking outside of the box and recognizing uh, 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 various other problems. Uh, but but anyway, uh, more on that later if you're interested. But the, the point I want to make here is that we often find a lot of people coming up with all kinds of suggestions, in, many of them very well intended but which do not recognize the reality of where, what we live in. What is possible, for example, so-called modern monetary theory, is possible in the United States precisely because of what is called the exorbitant privilege. The exorbitant privilege was in the Bretton Woods Agreement of 1944. It seemingly ended in 1971 when the US, when President Nixon withdrew from the from the Bretton Woods uh, Agreement unilaterally because of European pressure, but what we have seen is ever since then, especially thanks to the to to uh, to King Faisal's agreement in in the early seventies that the, the that the OPEC price increases of the nineteen seventies would be that that payments for oil and gas would be settled in U.S. dollars. That was a very important. Uh, prop and it resulted in people talking about 
uh, oil as the new gold. But the, the fact of the matter is that that has helped, but a variety of other arrangements. So people like uh, Tun Mahathir, for example, when he was a trade minister uh, in the late 1970s, uh, he introduced, he uh, negotiated uh, agreements, uh, which he called butter trade agreements. They're strictly speaking, not butter trade, but basically saying, okay, uh, we, 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 we will, we will, uh, you buy our palm oil and we will buy uh, your, your beef. That's why most beef in, in Malaysia comes from India. More than 80% of the beef in Malaysia comes from India. It's actually uh, very healthy because it's buffalo meat rather than cattle meat, which is less healthy uh, compared to buffalo meat. I'm not, I, 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 I don't, uh, uh, I, I, I no longer take duck meat, but you know, that's a personal, uh, a personal choice. But the point is that um, you know, among bovines, uh, that is a, a, a better meat. And similarly, he made arrangements with, with uh, the Soviet Union and Russia, uh, sorry, Soviet Union and then uh, Pakistan, and then finally with China. So these were very, very important arrangements at a time when there was no longer an international monetary system. And as Professor Robert Triffin pointed out many years ago, there is still no settled international monetary system. So we are living in a world which depends on confidence. And, and if you don't have any confidence in this system, this system won't work. Now, I'm going to uh, move on again very quickly to emphasize that the stagnation, unfortunately, is worsening for reasons which I've already uh, mentioned. And I think it's important to recognize, uh, the, to, to, to put those the, the various things I, I have said together, but they should still be very much in your mind, so I won't uh, summarize uh, the what the forces leading to de depression. But I want to just quickly go through a couple of elements uh, regarding non-alignment and why I believe non-alignment is very relevant. I think it is still possible to have international cooperation in the context of Cold Wars. Uh, if you think, for example, in 1979, uh, at the WTO, the Soviet Union challenged um, the, the U.S. at that time led by Pre President Jimmy Carter to eradicate smallpox. And together, the WHO, together with the U.S. and the, and, and the Soviet Union, managed to eradicate smallpox within a decade. This was a, a major achievement. Uh, so the older ones among us will still remember, uh, you know, smallpox was a reality. But now, of course, it is history. And this was possible precisely because of that kind of, of cooperation. And it's important to recognize also that many of the commitments which were made to President Gorbachev at, towards the end of the Soviet Union have not been honored. And we are now living in a very dangerous world precisely because those commitments have not been honored. Now, the high tide of the non-aligned movement was between the 60s and the 1980s. But, the, the, but it is often said to be now irrelevant with the end of the first Cold War. I would like to suggest to you that with the new Cold War, for a variety of reasons which I won't elaborate on right now, we now have a situation where it is more relevant than ever to have a way of dealing with, the, with what some people refer to as the second Cold War. Uh, we cannot, we should not participate in this war between uh, between the, 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 the US and its allies, uh, mainly Western allies uh, and, and versus China uh, or Russia uh, and so on. Uh, and it's important to recognize that whereas many of us once looked upon Europe as a possible ally uh, for developing countries, in fact, the attitude of the Europeans themselves has changed. The high representative of the European Union, Borrell, jo Joseph Borrell, um, basically considers the rest of us like weeds uh, attacking the garden, the paradise uh, the, 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 uh, uh, of, of Europe. And this is the world in which we live. Let's face it, you know. So let so moving on very quickly, I would like to make a case for a new non-alignment, uh, which does not take sides in the new Cold War. Um, and I would like to elaborate that in a moment uh, by referring to 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 um, to uh, uh, the, the Malaysian case. But let me just emphasize here that um, Mr. Trump and Mr. Abe uh, before after him, uh, you know, followed from him, 
uh, they have basically formed an alliance uh, in the in the so-called encirclement of China, and this is the reality in which we live in this region. It is a very dangerous world, and unfortunately, some countries in Southeast Asia, which once committed to creating a zone of peace, freedom, and neutrality, have basically uh, you know offered more military bases, for example, to the U.S. in northern Luzon, uh, in the Philippines. Now, let me move on to considering some, why, why it's important for us uh, in Malaysia. Um, now, this era of quantitative easing uh, actually sustained a relatively high uh, share prices in the Malaysian market until fairly recently. It's important for us to recognize that many people um, you know, who own wealth, who own wealth in the form of shares, actually benefited from this. So it's not it's it's important to recognize that the enemy is not without within uh, within our own society we have people who who think in these terms as well. Now, uh, when you think about Malaysia and 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 GDP growth, I think looking at the last three decades, for instance, uh, for the previous era, I've argued many times before that our economy is very open, very vulnerable, and we you know the vicissitudes the volatility of the economy is very apparent and this this uh, graph basically reinforces that point now it is also important to recognize that in the recent period basically from around 2016 the number of setbacks have basically increased partly due to covid-19 but also due to a variety of other factors which are which are going on uh, which have which are problematic and uh, the budgets the various budgets which have been introduced have really not helped uh, but really exacerbated the situation. It's important for us to recognize that trade growth in the recent period, we are basically talking about the last decade, has been very modest. And at times, trade has actually dropped, for example, during the first year of the pandemic. Um, this, this is the reality. So even without forgetting about the pandemic, we are talking about 2% growth, okay? 2%, 3%, maximum 4% growth as opposed to the kind of gro growth which we... So once upon a time, we used to think that exports lead, gro lead growth in, Mal in Malaysia. With this kind of export growth, of, of trade growth, um, th those, that period has basically passed. Now, the other point to remember and why, why I make the case for non-alignment is let's look at where we export our, our, our products to. Um, Singapore, of course, is our largest partner, mainly because it's a trans for, tra for purposes of transshipment. Although, of course, a lot of food, etc., comes from Malaysia, goes to Singapore. The second largest uh, trading partner is China. Uh, and the third largest trading partner is the US. So if we take sides in this war, if you take side, if we take the US side and offend China, or you take the Chinese side and offend the US, you are basically going to lose. And this is why I would make a simple, pragmatic, e economically pragmatic argument for non-alignment. So friends and colleagues, I think it's very important for us to recognize that we continue to remain a very open economy at a time when being an open economy no longer uh, is the, provides the basis for much growth. And we really need to have some serious rethinking. Unfortunately, as you, all of you know, uh, the kind the kind of serious rethinking has not, has not happened uh, in in this country for for many decades. And I do hope uh, those of us who are concerned about these kinds of issues will begin to uh, seriously think about it. Now we have seen, of course, an increase in unemployment. We have seen uh, consumer price increases and so on in the recent period. And I don't want to, 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 to spend too much time on it, but I think you, I, I hope to have persuaded you about the relevance and the relationship between, uh, between the, these dif different elements. Uh, on the one hand, the, the, the whole question of globalization and recognizing that globalization has, be, has changed uh, in recent times. We also need to recognize that there are other changes which have been taking place. And very importantly, we have to recognize that there are um, a, a, a range of, of issues. Uh, so we need to, to begin to think very seriously about public policy appropriate to our national interests, rather than dri driven by personal animosities or even by 
uh, narrow part partisan uh, considerations, let alone by ethno-populism, which unfortunately has been the case uh, in this country. So I do hope that this has been persuasive, and I want to thank you, and I, I, I want to uh, 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 wish you well. And most importantly, I think we have to seriously think about peace in our times, as it is very relevant um, uh, not only for our own survival, but the survival of humanity itself and the survival of the planet. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Prof. Jomo, for a very intriguing and insightful lecture. If I can just highlight the key issues that has been presented is that, number one, sanctions being the weapons of economic warfare, and then uh, worsening of stagnation as well as uh, uh, inflation not accelerating, rate hikes, may not be, uh, you know, uh, it's a blunt tool. It affects the demand side rather than the supply side. And of course, last, last but not least, is that the new Cold War where uh, non-alignment is indeed relevant. So I think before we are now reaching to the second part of the uh, 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 today's session is now we would like to go to the next agenda. We're going to listen to two renowned discussions. We have with us today, Emeritus Professor Dr. Jamal Osman, Professor Jamal is an Emeritus Professor of Resource and Environmental Economics at the Faculty of Economics and Management, uh, University of Kebangsaan Malaysia. He was Founding Secretary General and Deputy President of, for APM. Currently, Prof. Jamal is a Fellow of APM and Honorary Fellow of Institute Master Depan Malaysia, MASA. Uh, among, among Prof. Jamal's areas of expertise are National Resource and Environmental Economics, applied macro and microeconomics policy and project analysis. So without further ado, may I now call upon Master's Professor Jamal to present his lecture, his comments. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi Very good morning and salam madani to everyone, particularly to the moderator and to our eminent uh, speaker, Prof. Jamal and uh, my colleague, uh, Prof. Uh, Datu Zakaria, as the other uh, discussant. Uh, first and foremost, of course, uh, I would like to express my appreciation to APM to consider me, to you know, giving me the honor to be uh, one of the discussants for our eminent speaker today. And uh, indeed, uh, Prof. Yamo has uh, spoken uh, something which reflects greatly his, his, uh, his expertise uh, ref reflects what is well known of uh, as, as the nation top uh, political economist. And he has taken us uh, into a, a journey very compactly, a journey on the, the realities of the current realities on globalization, war and non-alignment and how this may impact our economy. So it's, it's such, and an amazing topic itself is such a, a pulling, a crowd pulling uh, topic. Uh, I'm very sure. Uh, looking at the crowd, uh, we have some 73 participants here online, but uh, many more perhaps uh, over YouTube. A anyway, uh, I won't be commenting on every single bit of this uh, great uh, presentation, but I just uh, pick up a, a few points, those that might be uh, more relevant. Uh, to, to my interest rather than perhaps, uh, you know, something that Prof. Jomo might want to advocate. First on, on, on plurilateral uh, trade arrangements, uh, you mentioned some of the developments, the historical evolution, particularly vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, GATT, uh, WTO, and, and the current uh, plurilateral trade uh, arrangements. Uh, uh, I think it's quite clear that uh, the impatience of many countries uh, globally on, on, on the slow pace of WTO that led to these uh, plurilateral trade arrangements. And, and now we are seeing just uh, a host of such uh, pluri, plurilateral trade arrangements. And of late, we are seeing uh, CPTPP. Uh, the comprehensive and progressive uh, trans-Pacific partnership and uh, RCEP before that. And, uh, and now the latest one is uh, known as uh, Indo-Pacific uh, Economic Partnership. Uh, so this many reflect 
much the impatient of countries to the slow pace of uh, WTO. And in, in the advent of this uh, infrastructure, very efficient infrastructure on communication, I think is kind of inevitable that uh, we may see even more uh, pluri-retro uh, trade arrangement, but of course with, with many different uh, emphasis. Now, we, we uh, Prof. Yomo has, has mentioned very clearly that uh, the, the Indo-Pacific Indo economic arrangement in particular is quite different from that of the traditional uh, traditional free trade arrangement like the CPTPP or, or even uh, TPP itself and, and, and RCEP. These are the major ones. Yes, uh, this to me reflects very much that the tariff barriers across the world are actually very little, very minute. And, 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 and for, for that matter, even uh, if, you, if you look at uh, the impact, of, uh, the probable impact of CPTPP as well as RCEP, the trade gained is actually be very little coming from uh, tariff removals, but rather the trade gains uh, maybe expect to come a lot more from the removals of the various non-tariff measures. This reflects very much that uh, tariff removals have much been taking place over the years uh, since the advent of the various uh, plurilateral trade agreements. And, and therefore, we can expect uh, trade gains to come from uh, tariff uh, liberalization, but, but rather it shall come from various non-tariff measures reductions. And in the case of uh, I, IPEF, uh, the, the emphasis on uh, the emphasis on resiliency, the emphasis on the, the quality of trade itself, that actually is, 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 is still, a, a, is still a, a reflection of the aims of, of uh, CPTPP, or the former one, the CPPA. Trade the quality, fair trade, for example, trade resiliency is actually embedded uh, Way, way in, in, in the agreements in terms of uh, CPTPP and, and, and TPPA. But again, the focus on, on, on uh, not on uh, tariff removal reflects very much that uh, very little uh, expectation is placed on, on the impact of uh, tariff removals. And indeed, uh, when we talk about trade resiliency, especially in terms of maintaining or sustaining the global supply chain, that is, it's going to be a, a new thing, I, I believe, a new emphasis. It's all about resiliency, not just trade res resilience, but in the end it's about uh, the resiliency of our economic processes. That's the underlying thinking. And I think uh, we in Malaysia here, our policymakers should also be looking into that. Uh, the gist is about uh, resiliency, not just about maintaining uh, trade processes, trade uh, Relations, but also the overall economy. The idea must be based on how resilient our our economy is. And uh, Prof. Yuma mentioned about trips. Uh, this has been a, a very much uh, traditional or classical issue: trade or related intellectual properties and, and services. Well, again, this is a, basically a, a repercussion of monopoly power. Intellectual properties uh, basically related to. Mono, mono, monopoly power of the producers. I guess in the end, uh, our country need to build uh, our own indigenous capacity to address these issues. And uh, on interest rates, uh, it's very interesting that Prof. Jamal really uh, support the idea of uh, not to, to increase interest rates, uh, to follow that of, uh, of the US, which still is still uh, you know, exploring that, uh, exploring to, to increase further the interest rates. Uh, even though they have already the so-called inflation reduction act taking place or, or ongoing or in the process at least, but still their mainstay is still to, to improve or to increase, sorry, to increase interest rates. I, I agree with, with Prof. Yoma in this sense because uh, looking at the, the global economy as a whole, uh, we can see much uh, equilibrium, much uh, so-called uh, efficiency in the marketplace Whereby I believe, uh, you know, interest rates are are no more a, a prime concern, uh, especially when we, when we talk uh, when we talk about uh, trade relations. Uh, Malaysia's uh, main uh, trade partners are 
are the same in terms of uh, export markets and, and the source of imports, we still consider China first, second, uh, US and third Singapore. These are the three major partners uh, both in, in export markets and in our source of imports. So meaning that uh, our exchange rates, uh, particularly USD, versus ringgit in, in particular, will be kind of uh, equilibrium in the long run. Because uh, that is, you know, it's to our interest to see an equilibrium in this uh, US dollars uh, to ringgit action rate because of these uh, realities. Uh, our three major importers uh, are the same as that of our, our uh, import sources. So I think <laughs> we can expect to see a strengthening US dollar in, in the long run. And we say that, hey, this is a good thing. No, I don't believe that. And in the end, it's equilibrium or uh, stability in our share rate, particularly uh, between US dollars and, and uh, ringgit uh, would be, you know, it would be the main thing, would be the in thing due to these uh, trade uh, relations between Malaysia and the three uh, major trade partners. And on um, stagflation, I agree with Prof. Janot that uh, inflation will be well contained across the globe and uh, Recently, there was a, a, a study on this, a global study on how economists across the world view this the stagflation, or particularly inflation. Uh, I, I think that uh, inflation has well uh, reached its peak and it, it won't accelerate further. It will be well contained. And, and Malaysia, I think, can expect that uh, inflation will not accelerate further given the you know, given the what we have been doing so far in terms of, of policy instruments and, and so on. Then. Now on uh, G7 and, and NATO with Prof. Jamal, believe that they, they are, you know, they are retarding growth <laughs> through their uh, repressive or regressive policies or, or, or so-called geopolitical uh, priorities. That, I tend to agree with this, but uh, this may not be, uh, I guess, a, a long run character. It may be due to certain transitory geopolitical issues, just like uh, US versus China. It was due to some transitory uh, issues happening, some fundamental issues though. And, and now we are seeing uh, Russia and Ukraine, uh, you know, confrontation and I hope this will be reconciled. It will go back to the normalcy. It will be back to the initial equilibrium and the world will move on as it used to. So I believe this, uh, this won't be a, a long run character because of the, the realities of globalization where social globalization, especially you, you, no one can stop it. Yeah. That's the character of the world for, for many years to come. And on the, on the note for Malaysia to look into our own ways, not to venture, not to look up north or, or west, but rather to look at ourselves in, in building our approaches, our strategies, our public policies and, and so on. Uh, I really support this uh, devoted uh, I believe that we have not explored very much. We have not explored adequately what we have at our disposal. For example, uh, when we talk about international monetary system, we are still dependent on, you know, this, as Prof. Yuma mentioned, the belief in the system, the belief in the system, then life goes on. I, I don't believe it, quiet man. Yeah, although that's the reality now, it's something practical. But you know that uh, the changes in action rates every second, every moon, the action rate changes due to a host of factors, including capital flows, and this affect trade competitiveness. This has affect the prices, you know, across the globe, across the globe, and in the end, it may disrupt our economy entirely, just like. Uh, what we saw in the 97, 98 uh, financial crisis, it was quite much due to capital flight, which led to the, you know, to the plung of our ringgit vis-a-vis -vis, uh, US dollars. But uh, let me say this, in, in Islam, uh, only prices can change due to 
supply and demand factors, prices of goods and services may change, but price of money, no change at all, because money carries no price tax at all. And I believe, I'm an economist, uh, I'm saying this, that uh, the price of money is actually interest rates as well as uh, exchange rates. These are prices of money, price tax for, for money, unfortunately, so qualified money. And we shall not allow this to happen, although it's very difficult to reconcile this because this is already a system which, which has been adopted by the whole wide world. And, but nevertheless, theoretically, and it's, it's not something that uh, should be a permanent thing. We must do something with like-minded people, sorry, like-minded countries uh, to look into alternative or radical solution to our international financial system where there is no price for money. Prices may change only for goods and, and services due to, yeah, due to uh, of course, the supply and demand process. And another thing is to look into whether or not uh, we shall still be looking at growth as something that reflects progress. And, and when, we talk, when we talk about growth, it's always related to the measure of, of uh, economic output, which is GDP. That's the conventional measure of growth. And, and we know that uh, GDP was not designed to, to reflect uh, true progress or well-being. It was designed to measure, yes, the value of economic outputs. But until now, we still think that uh, GDP is, is, you know, is a good measure of not just uh, economic outputs, but uh, well-being as well. And that's not right. So trying to associate this with what Bob Jumar was saying about looking at uh, ourselves in terms of various aspects, we need to come up with the right thing to measure true progress, but not to say that GDP shall be abandoned. No, it shall be complemented with uh, thing up of alternative measures to look at uh, the measure of true progress, which is quite comparable to GDP though. So, and uh, on the, the open economy, which is no longer, you know, no, no longer taking us to the part of economic growth as advocated by, or as I get from Jamo. And I, I agree, because in the end, uh, I think the whole wide world is saying that uh, growth is, is no more, you know, something that guides policies, but rather, rather resiliency, economic sustainability, well-being, welfare. It, it's rather the, the in thing now. And here we need to, again a, a different kind of measure to to really uh, to really reflect whether or not we are moving on that path, which is the economic resiliency, economic processes that lead us to well-being, that lead us to the so-called uh, SDGs, and you know, so that's such a wide thing when talk about SDGs, but uh, GDP certainly will not be the right measure to tell us whether or not we are on the path of uh, moving towards the goals of sustainable development. And again, this is associated with uh, Prof. Jamal's call for looking at ourselves rather than the up north or, 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 or the west. Well, uh, I think uh, that's all I could share on, on this beautiful uh, deliberation on, on the topic by our, I mean, uh, political economist. Uh, Prof. Jamal, and uh, let's, uh, let's listen to the views of uh, my, my other colleague, Prof. Dr. Zakaria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matters Prof. Dr. Jamal Usman, uh, for a very interesting deliberations. May I now call upon the second discussion, a Matters Professor, Datuk Dr. Zakaria Abdul Rashid, allow me to give, to introduce, uh, to give a short introduction of Dr. Dr. Zakaria Abdul Rashid. Professor Zakaria is an Emeritus Professor at the UPM School of Business and Economics. He was the Deputy Dean of the School of Graduate Study at UPM and Executive Director of the Malaysian Institute of Economic Research, MIER. Currently, he's a member of the National Wage Consultative Council and the Deputy Chairman of the Technical Committee of the Council. His areas of specialization include development economics, input-output economics, international economics, technological obsolescence and change, and others. So may I now invite Yang Berbahagia Master Professor Dr. Zakaria Abdul Rashid, Dr. Dr. Zakaria Abdul Rashid to, to give his presentation. Over to you, uh, Dato. 
<clears throat> thank you very much, uh, APM, and also I feel honored uh, to be together with uh, Rob Jomo, who has been uh, giving very interesting uh, lecture on uh, uh, globalization as uh, and also the impact on the Malaysian economy. Uh, but uh, in my uh, uh, comment on uh, his uh, paper on today's topic, I would like to see, or I, uh, or, or I would like to discuss more on the uh, the topic on the what will be the uh, impact on the Malaysian economy, uh, especially uh, uh, with the current developments in the globalization of the world and also uh, how whether uh, uh, or how Malaysian economy can be uh, moving towards a recovery and also moving forwards towards uh, uh, higher growth in the 2025 when the Rancangan Malaysia ke-12 or uh, in 20 or, or in 2030 or, or in 2030 uh, first of all uh, I think this topic is very interesting topic. Uh, I would uh, say that most of us uh, who who uh, doesn't who 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 doesn't understand the dynamic of the global world as what has been deliberated by Prof. Jomo would find is quite difficult to uh, give his view on Malaysian economy. Uh, especially when we, uh, among the economies, we try to prescribe certain uh, uh, solution uh, by uh, employing some of the tools uh, that we have uh, learned from uh, textbook economics. I think the world is uh, rather more complicated than what we have uh, acquired the knowledge from the from from the universities. First of all, uh, let me uh, say that uh, as what Prof. Jomo has mentioned just now, Malaysia is a very open economy. We are small. We are about 0.4% of the, of the global GDP. Uh, but uh, our, our, our international penetration into the, in, into the global world is quite high uh, by looking at, the, looking at the total trade figures. Uh, however, what do what do we have? Uh, if we want to guarantee, or we want to ensure that our economy will be moving forward uh, as what we have uh, aimed for, there. So in this dynamic and changing global world, we uh, it, it is very important to position ourselves. Uh, we look at look, if we, if you look at the uh, the current development as what has been described by Prof. Jomo just now, either military war or or non-military war, which is more important than that, which is more important than the military war right now. So how we position ourselves, uh, and uh, to do this, I would like to I would like to uh, look look at the some of our looking looking inwards looking at some of our uh uh what uh, how 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 can i say looking at our capacity in 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 leveraging on the development in the world economy uh <clears throat> uh if you look at the if if, if you look at the uh, our economy right now uh we will be able to benefit from uh, 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 regional partnership or in the globalization uh, if we keep ourselves uh, especially our production sector as most efficient as possible but uh, i will i will i will i will uh, i will elaborate more on this uh, <clears throat> but uh, the what we will benefit from that is from our 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 from from our export and as what uh, 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 Prof. Jomo has said just now 
uh, we have certain major uh, export destination like Singapore, ASEAN, US, China, and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, let me uh, let me focus more on some other things uh, on the more of the commodity that we or product that we are exporting. Uh, we are exporting. Uh, we we are, our 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 major export export items are uh, uh, ENE, uh, CPO, uh, 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 crude oil, and and and, and gas. So th so that means uh, if previously we rely very much on we we uh, on 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 global trade. Uh, on on export and on export to 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 generate growth, but recently I think about uh, one 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 or two decades ago, uh, our 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 source of growth has been shifted towards more uh, domestic economy, uh, or or more towards domestic uh, sources, uh, but. If we look again at the, the 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 kind of product that we export, so from there we can see whether uh, export of the economy can still generate growth or not. So now uh, I will uh, focus more on the uh, the the, uh, the 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 production efficiency of our economy. Of course. Uh, Oh, uh, the development of the world economy, as what has been described by Professor Yomo, is very important. We will should we 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 should align ourselves uh, with the uh, not uh, supporting directly U.S. or China, but rather uh, uh, take a stand of uh, non-alignment. Uh, I I I would totally agree with that. <coughs> uh, so. But uh, having 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 uh, what you call having uh, uh, got uh, having uh, get ourselves to our uh, uh, to to the right market for our export uh, is one important thing. But another important thing is the kind of uh, 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 product that we exported. Look again at our. Uh, Product that we exported just now, uh, we exported CPO and also uh, a petroleum refinery, and uh, we export also uh, oil and gas. These products, these products are able to generate uh, uh, high growth for the economy, uh, and also, but. But another another product that we are exporting is E and E elect, uh, electronic and electrical machinery, uh, like uh, uh, TV, radio, and also uh, 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 transmitters. Uh, this product, uh, unlike the three products that I mentioned just now, uh, E E E E and E is the uh, major product. Then, then the number one exporter of our economy, but in term of uh, in term of uh, growth multiplier, uh, I I would say that uh, it has a very small uh, growth multiplier, but uh, E and E is very important to us because for for the high volume of uh, export that we are uh, exporting this kind of product, uh, but. The when when you look at the output level, it's it is not it is not enough to look at the output uh, output level when we say that the economy when when the good when the world is growing, then the the economy will also would will also be growing too, uh, as well. But more but uh, most important thing is uh, look at the value added, and uh, the the three product that I mentioned just now: CPO, uh, oil and gas and uh, petroleum refinery uh, has uh, quite high value added compared to uh, the 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 fourth product that uh, that is the e and e this is because uh, e and e has a high component of uh, intermediate input 
which is imported from other countries. So that means uh, when uh, the global world is uh, experiencing uh, expansion, experiencing expansion in uh, in in output, then we we would be able to export all those items, all those products. But uh, but for the first three for the first three products just now, that will also that will contribute very much to our uh growth growth of gdp but not our e and e uh, because uh when they when because uh, another thing the e and e as i said just now uh we have to import uh quite a great amount of uh, imported input from overseas from other countries in order for us to export uh for to 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 to, to export e and e uh maybe maybe and uh, uh another another interesting observation that i would add here is uh on the whether the 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 the, the expansion of the global world uh if there is expansion of the global world uh, through our uh, regional partnership or through globalization would benefit the rakyat or not uh because uh, at the end of the day uh, what is uh, most interest what is most uh, important to us is wh whether the 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 expansion of the global world and also uh, the the uh, uh, expansion of our export will uh, at the end of the day will benefit the the the, the people and this can be looked at, at from our uh workers uh, salary and wages uh or, or compensation of employee uh but from all the three from the from the from the uh, most of from from all the four products that i mentioned just now which are export oriented uh product that we are uh, exporting our uh, our 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 ability to generate uh salary and wages that means our ability, our ability to add more wages to our workers is rather limited. Uh, this is because of our technological uh, technological level in this country is uh, rather uh, quite unsatisfactory. We are still uh, in our production method. We still rely very much on uh, low scale labor intensive uh, kind of uh, uh, techniques. And therefore, uh, if, even even for E and E, for instance, if we are able to export more, uh, but the workers, in terms of salary, in terms of salary and wages, and, and, and wages will benefit uh, very little. Uh, so that means here, uh, if I would like to summarize here, uh, what whatever Prof Jomo have said just now. The development of the world economy, the uh, the, the, the 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 dynamic of the uh, globalization globalization will benefit Malaysia, and uh, how it impact whether whether Malaysia will be able to move forward for uh, higher GDP. I would say that there is a possibility of uh, having that because, uh, as I said just now. We are a, a sort of uh, Malaysia economy, a sort of uh, just riding on the world business cycle. So that means if the world is expanding, then we will also be expanding uh, together with the world. But uh, if the world is contracting, and uh, we will also be uh, suffering. This is what uh, we have uh, observed recently. Just recently, that. Uh, when the world is uh, start to recover right now uh, in the data from department statistics show that our export and import is expanding uh, uh, but the expansion of the expansion of a uh, world economy and our expansion of the uh, uh, of, 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 our, of our of our of our domestic economy doesn't guarantee that we will be able to achieve uh, what we have aimed for uh, in our uh, job nature plan 
and uh, and 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 also of our 2030 or wasan 2030 uh, objective because uh, there there are a lot of uh, structural problem that we are still uh, facing and uh, i think uh, if we want to if we want to leverage or if we want to benefit more from uh, the development of the global world we have to we have to undertake uh, structural uh, reform in our production techniques uh, so that uh, we will be able to improve our productivity we will be able to increase our uh, skill level but maybe let uh, let let me mention another things uh, what what from jomo just mentioned just now uh, about the when when uh, when the world is uh, expanding then uh, uh, country like Malaysia, for instance, uh, we are sort of experiencing uh, full employment. Unemployment rate is below than below four uh, percent. We able we 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 are able to uh, achieve uh, below four percent after COVID nineteen. Uh, but uh, but we are actually actually we are facing uh, different kind of problem. Even though our unemployment rate is uh, low, but uh, we are actually in, 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 in uh, experiencing quite substantial amount of uh, underemployment. Uh, uh, especially, uh, I think a, lo a lot of us uh, would uh, would agree that, uh, for instance, uh, graded would find difficult to get uh, appropriate employment. Uh, so they are graduates from, uh, for instance, from, uh, from 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 engineering faculty, but they have to do some kind of other job uh, below than be below than that what they have uh, learned from the university, or or they have to uh, take a job of uh, 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 some other job which is below than uh, what they are, have been trained. So they, they actually the underemployment, the the underemployment that are happening now uh, is quite serious even though we have already uh, able to uh, solve the problem of unemployment unemployment uh, uh, because of the uh, 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 close down because of the uh, close down of the economy uh, but we still have a, a kind of underemployment uh, as I said just now uh, because of uh, the most of the our our workers, uh, uh, they are they actually they are skill they actually they are they are equipped with the skill appropriate skill but they can't get a pro, uh, appropriate job uh, in the economy. So I think uh, with with that I think uh, I, again I thank I thanks uh, APM for inviting me to participate. Uh, on this discussion and uh, I also thanks uh, Prof Jamal and also Prof Yomo who have given me uh, the opportunity and uh, participate together with them. Okay, with that, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Emeritus Professor Dato Dr. Zakaria Abdul Rashid for the insightful comments. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before we continue with the next session, which is to invite Bob Jomo to respond to the comments, uh, uh, or the, uh, the deliberations made by the discussants, may I, may I now resp uh, respectfully invite Yang Berbahagia Tan Sri Muhammad Shafi'i Abdullah, who is here with us. Tan Sri, are you here with us? To give yes, I'm here. Yes, Tansri, uh, may I invite you to give a short comment on maybe, uh, you know, based on the lecture that has been uh, uh, given by uh, Prof Jomo and also the comments made by discussants, uh, particularly maybe on trips. Over to you, Tansri. Uh, I, I've got, yes, a short comment, uh, but I'm more particularly intrigued by what Professor Jomo uh, has said uh, in relation to non-alignment. Uh, it's actually a question rather than, than a comment. Now, I notice a non-alignment policy that uh, states adhere to. Um, do you have to make a declaration of non-alignment? Is it wise to declare or to just behave in a non-aligned fashion? That, that is my question, actually, I would like to pose. Okay, uh, maybe we can start uh, inviting Prof Jomo. 
to respond to Tanshree's question and then followed by other questions and also response if you have on the comments made by the discussions. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, Rosalind. Um, allow me to also thank uh, both um, Prof. Jamal as well as uh, Professor Zakaria and as well as uh, Tansri Shafi'i for the remarks. Um, both uh, Prof. Jamal and, and Professor Zakaria very much uh, complement uh, what I uh, what I was presenting. So I think they have underscored some of the specific challenges which, uh, which which the Malaysian economy faces, and I want to thank them for that. I don't really uh, disagree with with much of what they said, um, and I think it is our common responsibility, um, uh, particularly with the academy, to try to do much more in terms of advancing the quality of public discourse on these very pressing and urgent issues. And also to try to improve the 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 awareness uh, of Malaysians of others as well who are interested in the in what happens with Malaysia uh, to to try to improve the, the quality of the discussion. So for that, I'm I'm very appreciative. As far as Tanshri Shafi's uh, comment is concerned, uh, I I think uh, it is very important. Uh, you know, I don't think we can go through life in the world today. Um, you know, sort of uh, no comment, no no comment, right? Uh, this this is a world which is uh, where where everybody uh, is expecting uh, greater transparency in public policy. So I'm not so sure it is possible to just avoid being avoid taking positions uh, on on a whole series of things. Um, I think Tansri Shafi is hinting that we do not need to be aggressively non-aligned. And that, that I don't think I, 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 uh, I would disagree with. But I, I just want to refer to a little bit to what uh, uh, Tun Razak did uh, from, uh, from the mid-1960s. Um, you know, uh, you know at, at the height of confrontasi, when Indonesia and the Philippines were opposing the formation of Malaysia and so on, uh, Tun Raza uh, actually uh, turned to uh, the non-aligned movement. He turned to the Afro-Asian Solidarity Movement, which were symbolized by people like uh, Sukarno, the president of the adversarial nation. Uh, and he was not afraid to do that. Uh, in fact, uh, many people would even say that he, he and Tun Mahathir, because Tun Mahathir was also involved uh, at that time, uh, incurred the wrath of, of Tun Kaudur Rahman uh, for being in, uh, associated with such, uh, such movements. Now, um, now I, I'm not suggesting that we go around incurring the wrath of either, uh, either Tun Kaudur Rahman or the or the uh, you know or 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 the U.S. or, or China or Russia for that matter, but I, I think on many issues I think it was good that Malaysia took a principal position at at the UN General Assembly in voting against the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but I think it is also very clear that that many that the that that uh, many people. In Malaysia, including the, the government, implicitly recognizes that what Russia did was largely provoked, and uh, and so it is a very delicate thing uh, which we have. And unfortunately, with the high turnover of uh, leadership which we have in this country, um, we have often leaders who have never thought about certain issues, and of often suddenly are confronted with questions, and they are forced to take positions. And it's very important for us to be very careful in these times. Somebody might come to you, uh, come to, the, to the, the country with the nice, the sweetest of language, uh, the nicest of propositions, uh, and so on. And that's the way, you know, superpowers uh, tend to uh, get gain influence 
Um, but we have to be very, very uh, self-consciously non-aligned. Uh, we have to realize that, you know, uh, even the most, the sweetest of propositions uh, are, are often sugar coating for, 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 for something else. Um, so to, I think it is very difficult, especially in this day and age, unlike, say, uh, uh, six, five, six decades ago, uh, to not to take a position on, on many things. And uh, so I think I appreciate uh, Nancy Shafi's uh, hinting that perhaps we should not be aggressively so. Now, this is where I'm, I, uh, in, in the situation in the world today, where for all intents and purposes, let's face it, the, the non-aligned movement is moribund. Maybe not dead, but certainly moribund. So to take, to, 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 there is a need for people to advocate, to, to, to recommend, uh, to urge uh, many other developing countries uh, to join, join uh, to, to, to take such a position. Because I think the, the, our, our strength lies in unity. Our strength lies in finding other like-minded countries who face similar constraints and who and who would who would join in with us, and this I think is 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 extremely important uh, going forward. Uh, you know, uh, we 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 will reject any foreign interference in 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 our affairs, uh, and basically attempts to transform uh, not only our, our nation but also the the neighborhood, uh, the Southeast Asian nation, uh, into uh, a partisan uh, into a partisan. Um, uh, um, player in, in these things. And let's face it, this is happening. Um, there is something called the Indo-Pacific Strategy. It was only announced uh, last year, but that's certainly what the US is doing. There's also something else called the uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative and so on. And the Belt and Road Initiative as well as, uh, as uh, Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation it's less problematic in my view, uh, but certainly as far as IPS is concerned, Indo-Pacific, because it is explicitly political, whereas the Belt and Road Initiative and so on are much more uh, economic in nature. Um, you know, I, I still remember when I was a, 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 a student, uh, I was I was coming back overland from from uh, Europe to to Malaysia. Uh, and uh, and I was going through Afghanistan before the war. And Afghanistan before the war, I still remember the road from Herat to Kandahar was built by the uh, by the Russians, uh, by the Soviet Union. And the road from Kandahar to, to Kabul was built by the Americans. Uh, you know, that's an explicit example. Now, similarly, in Djibouti, the very small island in the Red Sea, you find uh, the Djibouti uh, people have have had a, have a number of different uh, uh, military bases, American military bases, European military bases, and uh, a Chinese military base, naval base uh, in in Djibouti. Now you know you can play that kind of game, uh, but it is you know sometimes if you don't know how to surf, you don't go in and try to surf and catch the next wave. Uh, and hope to catch the next wave simply on the basis of your good intentions. So I, I would strongly uh, recommend that we be wise and adroit, and in 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 terms of handling of foreign policy, uh, as should be the case as far as all other policies are concerned. So thank you, uh, Tansri. Thank you very much, Dr. Jomo. I'm sorry I cannot open my video. Something is not right with my <laughs> video. Anyway, there's a question, Prof. Uh, uh, by Prof Kuprin, a question for Prof Jomo. Will the coming together of Russia, China, India, and the Middle East bring down the power of the American currency and eventually break the monopoly in, in financial control of the world by the US? How will the US react to, uh, react to this? Over to you, Prof. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof Kuprin. Uh, I, I don't, I'm, I hesitate to to make too much of uh, short-term developments, you know, um, I think uh, what we have is, is I, I, I do think that the uh, 
the breakthrough as far as Iran and, and Saudi Arabia is concerned is a very significant breakthrough. Uh, but it still remains to be seen what will happen. Uh, you know, will the war against Yemen, for example, end? Uh, you know, and and uh, Malaysia is part of that war. You know, it's one of the 40 countries which is uh, participating in the invasion of Yemen. Uh, you know, this was decided uh, about a, a decade ago. Um, you know, th th these are all things. So I, I would very much like to see the end of that war on Yemen. Yemen is the poorest country in the Arab world, you know, and we have this uh, uh, war, you know, with, with uh, weaponry being brought in from the West uh, against a, a poor, helpless country. You know, it's a beautiful country with a rich civilization. Most of people, most of people, Malaysians who are of Arab descent uh, can trace their origins to Hyderabad, particularly uh, in, 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 in the Yemen. Uh, it is a, a, a shameful war, frankly. Uh, so I, I'm looking for that to happen. But, you know, it, let, let's see that happen. It hasn't happened yet. And, and, uh, and uh, there are many other problems in the Middle East as well. Um, likewise, uh, you know, it's not clear to me how, where, where India stands, you know. Uh, let us not forget that Narendra Modi was a great enthusiast of Donald Trump. And if Biden lose the next elections to, 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 to Donald Trump and Donald Trump comes back, uh, where will India stand? Will they re-embrace? Uh, Netanyahu, uh, ben Benjamin Net Netanyahu was a great enthusiast of Donald Trump. Uh, he's now back as prime minister of, of, of Israel, you know, and uh, they, uh, they made that deal, uh, so-called Abrahamic Accords, and create a lot of problems. So I think while they, these are very hopeful signs, which Professor Cooperan uh, re reminds us of, I think uh, you know we 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 have to be uh, we we have to encourage these these hopeful trends. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, let let us not let us not um, you know um, let us not uh, read too much into it. Uh, you know, I I hope he's right. I hope he's right that this represents a, a major realignment, uh, but it's not clear that it, it, it does yet. So I, 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 I would, it was, it's, it's kind of a cautious optimism. I also think that since uh, Tun Razak and, and uh, Tun Made, I do not expect the, uh, you know, uh, a major, uh, um, playing a major role on the international stage by the Malaysian government. So what Tan Sri Shafi was recommending may well be the order of the day for, for, for some time to come, that we will not see any, uh, you know, Malaysia taking a very high international profile uh, on many issues. But, you know, I may be wrong. Uh, you know, uh, um, the, the Prime Minister today, for example, is very well known internationally, and he may well uh, uh, choose to, 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 to go into... Uh, uh, to 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 be, to get much better in, in much more involved in 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 a wide variety of international matters. Um, for, Foreign Minister Zambri is uh, you know he 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 is not uh, he's not a, comp a neophyte. He he, he knows uh, quite a bit about the about world affairs, particularly from a particular his pers particular perspective. Uh, but you know I, it's not clear to me that we are very well equipped. Uh, it's not clear to me that Wisma Putra is as well equipped as, say, uh, uh, three decades or four decades ago, uh, when we had a very strong core of diplomats, uh, you know, who who who, who often uh, were were thinking on their feet. Uh, so it's it's I I would just be a little bit cautious about all that, uh, but I I hope you're 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 right. And I, I do hope that we will see a, a significant reformation at the world level. Let me stop there. All right, thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Prof. Jomo. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Jomo. I think it's quite, uh, how would I say, the worrying, you know, based on what you have uh, mentioned, that Wisma Putra is not well equipped at this juncture, right? Uh, maybe, you know, uh, academics should play a bigger role. Uh, and of course, uh, Prof, if I can humbly ask you a question with regards to the latest development on um, 
the uh, you know um, the banking collapse of the US and the Swiss and of course the Euro. Uh, should we be looking at the economic and financial models there, or should we be looking elsewhere? You know, for our future growth and recovery. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Rosalind. I, I honestly don't know enough about the uh, either sovereign bank or, 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 or Silicon Valley, uh, Valley uh, Bank uh, to comment on its international implications. Uh, in, 19, in 2008, when I was working at the UN, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I followed very closely because I was living in New York at that time, I followed quite closely the buildup of the vulnerability on the mortgage front. Yeah. Uh, and the, the mortgage bubble, which was building up. Yes. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I, I'm not especially interested in the American economy. And where I, I disagreed with the IMF at that time, uh, the, the chief economist of the IMF happened to, to get a professorship on the basis of work he did uh, on, on Malaysia, uh, basically based on the work uh, Professor Gomez and I did uh, many years ago. And um, so, you know, I, I, I basically said that this, what was happening in the U.S. has huge implications. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, they were disbelieving. Mm -hmm. The reason for saying so was because during that dec the preceding decade, a lot of things have happened, had happened. Michel Kamdesu as managing director of the IMF, contrary to the articles of agreement, particularly Article 6 of the IMF's uh, charter, mm -hmm. uh, had been pushing for opening up the capital account. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there was a Malaysian economist, uh, the late James Putucheri, who once uh, noted, you know, over, over uh, six decades ago, he said, it's the, the kind of thinking is like opening a bird cage and expecting more birds to fly in than to fly out. You don't expect more birds to fly in than to fly out. Mm -hmm. Even if you put a lot of bait of uh, <laughs> bird seed and so on, you might get birds to come in briefly. But they're not going to stay there uh, beyond right. uh, that tenure. So you know, so this kind of view uh, was 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 unfortunately prevails. You know, people expect uh, you know you have this uh, simplistic view about finance uh, flowing uh, from rich uh, capital rich countries to capital poor, poor poor countries, and even though it has been observed uh, uh, th uh, three four decades ago that cap that finance actually is flowing uphill from the capital poor to the capital rich countries. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, yes. unfortunately, pe people believe that was happening. But coming back to the to the, the whole question of collateralized debt obligations, mm -hmm. um, this is why I am collateralized debt, debt obligations did not die uh, with the global financial crisis in, in 2008. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, right now, uh, there are even more financial instruments. And so the level of debt is far higher in the world today. And the level of debt involves sovereigns or governments. Yes. Uh, and it's much, much more debt than, for example, four decades ago when the Latin American crisis happened and so on. But very importantly, the debt is of a, uh, involves many different types of instruments. The Latin American debt largely involves straightforward bank borrowings from US mm -hmm. and UK debt uh, banks. Today, the nature of debt is so complicated. It's much bigger, it's much more complicated, and it's much more and it results in a greater degree of fragility in the financial system. So non I am very, yeah, very worried. Non-collateral? You know, non-collateral non -collateral as well. Well, some of it is not collateralized, but so what if you have collateralized debt? Mm -hmm. It doesn't really mean very much to have collateralized debt. Mm -hmm. What you know when 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 you have a generalized breakdown in the system, mm -hmm. you know the value of your collateral goes down as well. Yeah, 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 you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let, Let's face it. You know when when the U.S. Fed and other central bankers say they are concerned about about inflation, what they mean is they are concerned about consumer price inflation. Yes. They are not concerned about asset price inflation. When yes. the price of assets go up in the stock market, when the price of assets go up in financial markets, when the price of assets go up in the real in the real property market, mm -hmm. you know they are not concerned about that. Mm -hmm. They are only concerned when it affects consumer prices. 
because the relative value of financial assets then goes down when you have an inflation on, con on consumer prices. So the, 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 the concern with inflation is a very, very biased inflation, mm -hmm. concern with inflation. And that's why I'm not, I'm very wary of central bankers. And we know, I mean, even conservatives like uh, Milton Friedman and Ben Bernanke pointed out many, many decades ago that, you know, the, it was the US Fed which made the Great Depression even longer than it needed than it was. Uh, it was uh, uh, the 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 U.S. Fed which cr transformed uh, the the uh, the oil price increase into a major financial crisis. So we have a situation where we, you know, I I am now no longer in a position where I'm I follow many of these things uh, with any degree of 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 uh, of uh, of uh, you know of of detail, uh, but I think what we really have, which is very, very, I am very concerned about the situation. I'm less concerned about uh, sovereign uh, sovereign bank and Sil Silicon Valley Bank because it's not clear to me what their systemic connections are with the rest of the of the of the world of finance. Mm -hmm. But you know, if they are the, if they are strong, then I would be concerned. Now. Um, Janet Yellen and, and uh, President Biden have bought time by using the FDIC, mm -hmm. the Federal uh, Deposit Insurance Company, to 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 save these banks. Uh, but you know the FDIC has limited resources, and this effort by Yellen and 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 uh, Biden uh, is is being opposed in, very strongly in the U.S. because this is not what FDIC was supposed to be set up mm -hmm. to do, you know. See, FDIC is supposed not to save the banks, but to save the depositors. Yes. Okay. So, so you have a, a fundamental difference of interest, mm -hmm. a perversion of the use. It's just like a quan, you know, a, a kumpulan wang aman. Uh, you know, that is really because we are taking out the oil and gas and we are mm -hmm. putting the money for the next generation. Mm -hmm. When we start using that money without even promising to replace it, then we are abusing trust. And this is what I think is extremely important for us to think about, uh, and, and and for future generations to think about. So the younger ones who are who are participating need to be concerned about what what is being done in their name, uh, in the name of the nation, uh, which is actually adversely going to affect the interests of future generations. So these are huge issues, and I'm very glad you raised that question, uh, Professor Rosalind. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Jomo. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have now reached at the end of the session. I think it has been, I believe it has been a very interesting session for all of us, thought-provoking, you know, inspiring, and of course, enriching. I would also like, before we end, may I invite uh, once again, Emeritus Prof. Dr. Jamal Osman for last words, and also, and also uh, Professor Emeritus, uh, Emeritus Professor Dr. Dr. Zakaria Abdul Rashid for his last words. May I now invite Dr. Jam Prof. Jamal first? The short one, Prof. <laughs> Last comments. Okay, I never expect this actually. Anyway, I think the end thing now is let's go for resiliency and let's go for economic sustainability and in the end is for overall well-being of mankind and society. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Jama. I also meant, I also remember you mentioning about a new measure of economic uh, performance, which incorporates resilience is needed yeah. right? and the well-being part. All right. Yeah. Next, <laughs> uh, all right. Next uh, to uh, Master's Professor Dr. Dr. Zakaria, if I may. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, whatever things happens in the in in, in the global world, uh, of course, we have to follow it closely. Uh, but uh, it's also very, very important for us to look inward in our own economy to make our economy become more efficient and so that whatever happened in the economy, I said say, I say just now, we are just riding on the uh, global business cycle. If, uh, so that means uh, if, we, if, we, if, if we equip ourselves with the efficient uh, production uh, structure, whatever things happen in the world, we'll be able to reap the most uh, benefit of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chato. I remember you mentioned also the three categories of products which will value add 
to the uh, recovery or economic growth, right? We have the uh, CPO, we have the oil and gas, and one more, the petrol, if I'm not mistaken. And E and E, as you mentioned, is not really contributing much to, uh, in, to, in terms of value adding, right? Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right, so I think uh, in closing, on behalf of APM and Economic Social Wellbeing Cluster, we would like to thank everyone for being here with us, and we sincerely hope that you have had a productive morning with us today. In an effort to Marayat Khan Academy Professor, we look forward to having more interactive sessions with everyone throughout this year, inshallah, in 2023. Again, I would like to again thank, uh, express our sincere gratitude to our honorable speaker today, Master's Professor Dr. Jomo K. Sundram, and then our two discussants, Professor Master's Professor Dr. Master's Professor Dr. Dr. Sorry, Emeritus Professor Dr. Jamal Osman and Emeritus Professor Dr. Zakaria Abdul Rashid. So before we end, can we have a, a question? And I'm very, unfortunately, my video is not working. So the rest, please switch on your videos for us to remember this moment. Thank you very much once again. All right. And and please help. All right. Um, I'm waiting for everyone to turn on their cameras, please. Okay. Monaima, are you ready? Yes, yes. We wait for some. Okay, I think we should. Some more? The students? Okay. Now you can take it. Okay, one, two, three. Okay. Second page. Hello, everybody. One, two, three. All right. Okay. On behalf of APM, thank you so much uh, to our speakers and our discussion today, and to all our participants this morning. We from APM very, really appreciate your attendees. So once again, thank you from us, and see you guys next time. <laughs>